to the 13th chapter. 13. We'll read verses 6 through 9. Let's read. He spake also this parable. A certain man had a fig tree planted in his vineyard, and he came and sought fruit thereon, and found none. Then said he unto the dresser of his vineyard, Behold, these three years I come seeking fruit on this fig tree, and find none. Cut it down, why covereth it to ground? And he answering said unto him, Lord, let it alone this year also, till I shall think about it and dung it. And if it bear fruit, well, and if not, then after that thou shalt cut it down. Amen. We use this passage in past and in, in, in times past, and we've talked about it. And we're going to take a slightly different approach to it today. It always has significance, and I like to use this verse because it's something that, from a traditional sense, has not been interpreted properly um, in Christendom, in mass churches all over the world. You see them talking about different things, and when it comes to this, they either glance over it or they just really don't see the significance of it. We're going to touch on the significance of it, but we're all going to also going to bring in another topic today that should be somewhat beneficial to our understanding as well. When we look at this particular passage, we see something here that is going to give us some insight on some, some uh, dispensational things as well as some insight on what God is doing with us today. Look at um, Romans, the 14th, 15th, 15th chapter, the fourth verse, real brief. Romans 15, 4. Romans 15. Some of you are very familiar with this as well. But Romans 15, chapter in the fourth verse. This is how we're going to approach this today. Look at this. Real, real familiar here. For whatsoever things were written aforetime were written for our learning, that we through patience and comfort of the scriptures, what? Might have hope. Might have hope. And this is important for us because God gives us an understanding of how we are to utilize those things that were written when? In time past. In time, time. Uh, in time past or for time because all of the Bible is for us. And that's what we have to recognize. And we'll get a greater opportunity to be more effectual witnesses if we understand that all the Bible is for us and how to uh, properly utilize all the areas of Scripture as it pertains to you and I. And this is something that's significant because we can enrich what God is doing with us by knowing what God has done with them in time past and what God is going to be doing in, in ages to come. Yep. So we, as, as, as often as an individual might try to uh, charge you with being a Bible chop or charge you with the fact that you only use Roman through Philemon, you only use Pauline epistles, it's simply not true. If you're a student of the Bible, you know and recognize the essential, the, the, the importance of understanding all scriptures because all scripture is beneficial for us for doctrine. Yes. And we have to understand how it applies, what God is doing then. And he's saying here, he's giving us some information. He says, whatsoever things were written aforetime were written for our learning that we, through patience and comfort of the scriptures, might have hope. I find comfort in looking back and seeing what God did in the book of Job and seeing how Job um, went through a particular situation and seeing how God was um, very steadfast and watching what Job was going through, how God restored Job at the end, how Job maintained his faith throughout the whole process of that and how God was pleased with Job maintaining his faith in the whole process. So it made me be like, well, okay, now when I'm going through a situation, I'm going to be like Job in that situation. I'm going to be the one that God is proud of. And I don't care how bad the finances is, how bad my health is, how bad certain situations are in my life. I want to be that one who continues to praise God and magnify God even when things don't look good. And we often have that opportunity. 
Life is going to present us with an opportunity that we always have an opportunity to give God glory when things don't look good. All right. And that's what he really wants. He wants us to know that in all things we should give thanks. Amen. Because all things work together for good for them that love the Lord, for them who are the called according to his purpose. When we begin to envelop ourselves in these truths, then we begin to have an opportunity to give God glory in everything in our lives. So when I look at this passage, I look at Romans 5. I mean, Romans 15 here. Four. And it actually points me back, and I'm going to look at some areas of Scripture back here. Like here we're in Luke 13. And then we're going to see how we can connect it to what is going on with us today. And see how the contrast, and see how we can get comfort from it. And see where patience comes in as it pertains to this text. So let's go back to Luke 13 chapter. Now this is fun just because it's good for our understanding here. Some of you know about this area of scripture in the book of Luke, but we're, if you don't know it, this will be good for you to know and understand because it, it's going to enrich your mind on how we got to this point. It's going to enrich your mind on the proper perspective of where we place the Gospels. Mm -hmm. Chronologically, what was happening during the era of the time when Jesus Christ was in his earthly ministry and what was actually manifesting itself and what's some of the key components that God wanted us to recognize that can comfort us even today. So we look at it and he said in verse 6, he spake also this parable. Now what's a parable? Some of you familiar with that? What's that cliche um, definition that somebody say a parable is? I don't need a heavenly story with an earthly message. Flip it. Flip it. It's an earthly story with a heavenly message. Uh, with a spiritual or heavenly message, you know what I mean? So he's talking about earthly things, things that we recognize, things that we know, but the real importance, the significance of what he's saying has some spiritual significance. So he lays out a parable. He's talking to Israel in parable. In fact, we were talking about it in, in Sunday school this morning, how sometimes there were things that, were trying, that, that he was trying to make known that he would keep somewhat hidden. He would only lay out the surface. And he did that for a reason as well. But he says, he spake also this parable, a certain man had a fig tree. Now, sometimes we looked at these things. I remember back in Sunday school when I was in church, they would just talk about these things from such a, 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 a secular or topical vantage point that you never grasp any spiritual significance out of it. We don't have time to fully investigate it, but I know a lot of you do understand it, so we're going to plug in some of the blanks so that we can grab some of the things out of here and get back to our topic here. He spake also this parable, a certain man had a fig tree and planted it in his vineyard. He came and sought fruit thereon and did what? So now we're going to lay out some characters here. First one we see is this certain man. What did the certain man do? He had a fig tree. He had planted a fig tree. So we start pulling out some of these items that we see in here, and we're going to begin to address some of the items. It says, a certain man had a fig tree planted in his what? Vineyard. Vineyard. This is an earthly story, isn't it? Yes. Everything here we can identify. It could be a certain man on earth. Any of us could be a certain man. A fig tree is earthly. A vineyard is earthly. So he's laying out some things that's, you know, very recognizable, especially to the individuals of that particular region, because those things were predominant there. So he says, a certain man had a fig tree, planted it in his vineyard. He came and sought fruit thereon and found none. Then he said, then said he unto the dresser of his vineyard. Now another individual comes here. Who's the next? Dresser. Dresser, amen. Now, when you're really looking and studying the Word of God, these things, you know, you have to make, get an understanding of so that you can fully begin to grasp what God is trying to express of, of his vineyard. Behold, these three years I come seeking fruit on this fig tree. Now we see another element here that we want to also bring in. Fig tree is still there, but what if we have we have a time element. What's the time element? Three, three years. years. Three years. 
Boy, I remember when I used to look at the Bible, none of this meant anything to me. That's right. Y'all so just really reading a story. That's right. If you don't know, you're about to find out something today. If you really don't know this, this was revolutionary to me. Come on. I don't take it for granted. Anytime I talk about it, I'm completely serious. There's some, some, some lighthearted jokes and stuff you might make about it. But this is one of the issues. These are the type of issues that the God of this world or the prince of the power of the air would want to keep hidden from you. Absolutely. Because it totally validates the fact that God has a mystery program that he's dealing with today that was not found in time past. And it gives you items that lead right up to what God is doing. And if you recognize what he said in time past, you realize that something had to interrupt it. I don't want to give you too much, but this is where we're going. When, you know, I find it important to try to summarize what I'm doing and express to who I'm uh, trying to express it to, to try to keep them focused to where we're going. Because sometimes people can just give you information, 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 and you don't know where they're going. And you practically fall asleep or just get bored or just get... Tossed to the side because the information they're giving you is a lot of it, but there's no direction to it. Amen. But this has some direction, so I hope you stay, stay, stay tuned and stay focused. And sometimes it's a little long-winded, but you know, hopefully spiritually you can, you know, maintain yourself long enough to, to grasp what we're doing here. These three years I come seeking fruit on this fig tree and find none. So his his decision that he makes is to do what? Cut it down. Cut it down. comes on and says, I find none. Um, cut it down, why cumbereth it? No, it's it, yeah. Why cumbereth it the ground? And he answering said unto him, Lord, at, let it alone this year. More time element, right? Mm -hmm. We want to make known, known to that. Let it alone this year. He goes on to say, till I shall dig about it and do what? I'm going to combine these two. Now, the whole message that we're talking about is really not this, but I just find this important to always try to go over whenever we bring this up because it's important for your understanding as members of the body of Christ, how to interpret things that are found in Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. Absolutely. Because I guarantee you individuals that really think they're teaching out of Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John because they don't really recognize what God is doing as power it pertains to the mystery, don't rightly interpret what's going on in Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. That's right. You need to have the ability to rightly interpret what's going on in Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. That's how we're going to get them out the snare. That's how we're going to be able to help them out. See, we can't help them if we really don't know. Or if we don't spend enough time there to really recognize what was going on or to try to interpret what the truthness of that passage is. We will just simply agree with them in that area and never really find an opportunity to find truth there that will set them free or make them free. Because that truly is what do. The truth is what's going to make them free. So when we rightly, rightly divide the word of truth and truly understand the text of what's going on, they have an opportunity to do that. Now, verse 9, and if it bear fruit, where? And if not, after that, what, what should he do? Cut it down. Cut it down. Now, this term comes up. So now what we want to start doing, and I'm going to do this based upon who knows it and who doesn't know it. We, I, I, time goes by so fast, so I really know some of you in here know it. So I'm going to ask some of these questions, and then we're just going to elaborate on just a touch so that individuals can be blessed by the hearing of it. If you don't have an opportunity, I suggest that you read this at home. Um, if you don't, those of you that are here, read it over. If you have any questions, we open up a form at the end that you ask, can ask the questions. But this is really not the main focus of this um, discussion today, but it's definitely important. So I just want to kind of fill in the blanks with this parable because what we're really going to talk about today, and I might as well put on this board, is the repentance aspect of this. Because we're going to contrast repentance. Because I find that members of the body of Christ are still confused about the term. And that's what this whole passage is really talking about. Let's look at verse um, 5 of chapter 13. 
I tell you nay, but except ye repent, ye shall likewise perish. This whole verse 13, 1 through 5 is talking about Israel repenting. Except ye repent, ye shall likewise perish. Repentance was something that Israel was looked upon to do. And we're going to go back and, and look just to kind of see exactly what type of repentance he was making reference to. But let's just do this as an exercise real briefly. When you look at this parable that God has given us in this book, who do you believe the certain man is? Now, if you know from the past, we try to be very specific in who we say these individuals are that plug in. If you're general, I'm going to show you where it's going to leave room for some confusion. Who is the certain man in this passage? Jesus Christ. God the Father. Now, I like that. See, we're going to deal with this real briefly. See, I want, I want you to be, I want your mind to be enthused about this. Someone said, God the Father. Someone says Jesus Christ. And, and I want to pull up, I'm just saying, this is why it's so important. We know I wouldn't have any problem in some circles utilizing any one of them interchangeable. But in this sense, you have to be more specific due to the fact that you know the Godhead is at work. So if I simply label Jesus Christ as the certain man, I'm not going to be, make a distinction between the members of the Godhead. So now if I know the Godhead is in action, now I have to say the particular members of the Godhead in which it's operating. So with that being said, who would the certain man be? God the Father. Amen. God the Father. Amen. Now we're going to interpret it once we fill it in. Now, the fig tree. Who would we say the fig tree is? And again, we need to be very specific when we make reference to this. Some of you may know, maybe some of you may not. If you don't know, don't worry about it. But we're going to show you why it's important to know and be specific in what you know. Who would be the fig tree? Unbelieving Unbelieving Israel. Israel. No. Unbelieving Israel. Who have you read the baptism of John? Okay, but based on the not believing baptism, that's what one says there. So, and don't worry, I mean, we're just getting some information out here. Anybody Absolutely. got anything different? So, unbelieving Israel who hasn't believed the baptism of John. Is that the only answer we got? I thought it was spiritual issue. Oh, what you thought? Well, Did you ever take that in to know that? Or you think, what's going on? Well, when I studied it out, okay. it's spiritual issue. All right, I like that. Now she says spiritual Israel. And that's a specific term because I imagine that she's contrasting spiritual Israel with. That's spiritual Israel. Okay, go ahead, brother. Religious Israel, but not true religion? Like false religion? Israel and false religion? Okay, now I like, I'm going to go with what you said first religious yeah. Israel. And see, this is why it's so important. If we never take time out to plug in the components that God actually has in place here, how can we possibly have ever interpreted this verse? Tell us the truth. If we don't really know and have never really thought about who these, who each individual uh, character is, what takes place in each aspect of this, how would we really know? It's the truth. Let's go back to the verse, see if we can get some information out of it. A certain man, God the Father, we came to that conclusion, had a fig tree planted, I'm going to bring in this next part, maybe this will help us out, in his vineyard. So these two will go together. God planted a fig tree in his vineyard. Let's get fig tree for one moment and say, where's the vineyard? Patience. All right, okay, anybody else? Somebody knows this, so we're going to go move along. Because I'm like, that's absolutely right. It's national Israel. This is a nation that God gave birth to, remember? Yes, sir. Remember God gave birth to a nation? And within the nation, God planted a religion, <coughs> which is the spiritual aspect of Israel. It's the only religion God ever gave. 
It's the only religion God ever gave. It's the Jewish religion. God made a way for them to commune with him through this nation in the religious system that he set up. Invoking true spirituality because his word was producing faith to them. So this fig tree, he, he planted a religion um, within this nation. Let's go a little further. You'll see how it all comes together. A certain man, God the Father, had a tree planted in his vineyard. Put that religious faith with the sacrifices and the, all the different, the temple and everything that implies to spiritual Israel in his vineyard within the nation of Israel. And he came and sought fruit thereon and found none. The fruit that he was looking for was the fruit of repentance. Somebody came afore Jesus Christ and began to preach repentance. We, we might have time to go there, but over in Luke uh, eighth chapter, I mean Luke the um, third chapter, you'll see that that's what John the Baptist, forerunner of Jesus Christ, was telling them, and different things like that, telling them to uh, to repent, for the kingdom of God was at hand. So he goes on to say, then said he unto the dresser of his vineyard. Now who's the dresser? God the Son. God the Son. You see why we say that now? You see why? Because God the Father is the one that was instructing the Son in his earthly ministry. He was getting all of his information. When Jesus Christ was in his earthly ministry, God the Son, he was getting everything from the Father. God the Father. So it's all God, but it's the different manifestations of the Godhead in practice. This is important. This is some things we need to know. So he goes on, he says, Then said he unto the dresser of his vineyard, Behold, these three years I come seeking fruit on this fig tree. Now, we just see the three years here. He says that he came seeking fruit on this fig tree for three years. What does the three years represent? His ministry. Who's? Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ. Amen. Who's? God the Son. God, God the Son. Amen. Right. So we're going to see God the Son, who we know is Jesus Christ, his earthly ministry. Why is this so important? Why would we highlight earthly ministry? You know how often it comes up in, in conversation when you rightly divide the word of truth? Mm -hmm. If you're trying to teach or study with anybody, oftentimes you're going to make it. That was Jesus Christ in his earthly ministry. That was Jesus Christ in his earthly ministry. I never thought that made a difference. When I began to understand what God was doing in time past, I recognized that to make the distinction between what God is doing now through Jesus Christ in heavenly places and what God did in time past through Jesus Christ in his, th in his three year earthly ministry is vastly different. One was according to prophecy. One was things that were foretold. One was kept a secret. He didn't tell anybody until he revealed it to the Apostle Paul. Some people still think the last thing that Jesus Christ said was when he went, um, went rose back into heaven in the book of Acts. How many of you know that's not the last thing that he said? You have to know and recognize that Jesus Christ spoke after that and he spoke to the Apostle Paul. But if you don't rightly divide the word of truth, those things will cause you grave error. Then said he unto the dresser of his vineyard, Behold, three years I come seeking fruit on this fig tree and find none. So now, because he finds no, truth, no fruit upon the tree, his remedy for finding no fruit was to what? Cutting down. What do you think the, fall, the cutting down would represent eventually? If it had to happen, what would it? Set aside the the set aside aside of Israel. Amen. What's another? What's another term for that, Jim? What else? What else? When they set aside, what? Just sort of link up with what I'm going to talk about later. <laughs> the fall. Amen. <laughs> the fall. Okay. <laughs> so we talk about that. So now he's he's bringing all these terms in. He's bringing all the terms that we need. And the reason we want to set it up with sound doctrine from time past, from a foretime, is because we want to show why how it harmonizes with truth that has been given to us. Some people think we're just talking 
you know, hopscotch all over the Bible. We know what we're saying really is the only way you'll make sense out of the Bible. Mm -hmm. If you don't understand what God is doing in this age in the dispensation of grace, all of this is confusion to you. And I know it's confusing because when I see a panel of you pastors asking questions, you're totally confused and don't have a clue what God is doing today. Amen. And both of y'all trying to say the, two, uh, two, the same thing cleverly two different ways and you're still wrong. <laughs> so we find that this is the problem and this is what happens when you don't rightly divide the word of truth or attempt to try to find out what God did in, past, in time past as it pertains to what he's doing right now. And he answered and said unto the Lord, let alone this year also. So we find another time now. Let alone this year also. What, what does this year represent? Father, forgive me for being here long, but they do. Amen. Jesus Christ on the cross asked them for forgiveness, and God gives them a one-year extension based upon that forgiveness that Christ asked for on Calvary's cross. Jesus came. He ready to cut. The Father is ready to cut it down. Jesus Christ on the cross says, Father, forgive them for they know not what they do. And that's the only thing that stops the Father from cutting it down right there. <clears throat> you have to get that. Okay. Traditional Christianity does not teach this. They, so this is something that has just been swept to the side and the further and the longer you sweep it to the side, the further you get away from truth. And this is what Satan wants. Satan wants you to be churchy. Satan wants you to come in and say, we go to church on Sunday and be proud that you go to church on Sunday. But he doesn't want you to be, be transformed by the renewing of your mind. He wants you to study the Bible. But he doesn't want you to rightly divide the word of truth. Because if you rightly divide it, now you have power to make changes. Amen. But if you don't, you fall right into his snare. His snare. Yeah. So this is why we come, we come each Sunday to empower, edify, encourage each other so that we can begin to be effective when we leave here. This should never be a situation where we come get information and, and he showed they preach. Well, what did he preach about? Well, I don't remember what he preached about, but it was so good. <laughs> I used to do that. And, and really, in essence, what I was saying, I had a good time at church because what I was accustomed to was a good choir singing and good music playing. And the preacher would, ah, yes, ah, yes, ah, won't he do it, ah, won't he do it, ah. And that excitement just was something that was almost electric, and I thought that was spirit. And if you didn't have any of that, you really haven't had church. If you're just doing what you guys are doing, just sitting there real attentive, reminded, that's not good. The spirit's not even in here. <laughs> really, so much so that I've had relatives come and say the spirit's not in your church. The spirit don't even, I did, I didn't, nobody said praise the Lord. Nobody was running. Nobody was speaking in tongues. Nobody was shouting. Nobody was, you know, so the spirit was not in. But you know where the word, the, where the spirit is? Oh, right, there you go. You know where the spirit is? It's in the word of God, but you know where he also abides? In you. Hallelujah. You brought him with you when you came in. So you told me if the spirit ain't in here, that means when you came, you didn't bring him. We walk by faith, not by sight. The only thing that makes a difference to us is what the word of God says. I don't care what it looks like. The word of God is the only thing that I make my judgment based on. And that has to be rightly divided and sound. So he goes on, he says, and he answered and said unto him, Lord, let alone this year. And he said, that's that year of extension. He said, Father, forgive them for I know not what they do. But then he goes and he says, till I shall dig about it and do what? Amen. This represents something. What do you do when you put dung in the soil? You do what? You fertilize. What does fertilizer do to the soil? Enriches it. It, 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 gives that, it, it gives it life. It gives, gives it life. It gives that soil power. Mm -hmm. So in essence, what the dung was going to represent, he, and just like Jesus Christ, so you know this is Jesus Christ, he gives them extension. What did Jesus Christ promise that he would send back? The What's the dung that he said he's going to send back that's going to empower? The Holy, the Holy Spirit. So now this dung represents what manifestation of the God here? God the Holy Spirit. 
So, and I want you to say that because I want you to see how the Godhead operates as it pertains to this particular parable. Absolutely. You have God the Father, you have God the Son, you have God the Holy Spirit. Absolutely. So when we begin to understand that now when we express this to someone else, they will see each dynamic, each interpretation of what is represented here, and it would have to subvert anyone who does not understand the truth. Because you can't go up and you can't do anything against the truth. Except just call it, I, I, I want to hear it. But the truth is the truth, and you can't, you can't make this be something different. Amen. It only makes sense when you properly put each piece of the puzzle in place. So now we know and recognize that this was the sending back of the Holy Spirit. But the failure for Israel to repent, let's see what the repentance they was looking for. Let's go to Luke 3. Luke 3. Baptist, John the Baptist comes, <coughs> Luke 3, 7. He's a forerunner of Jesus Christ. And this is, he's preset the scene, okay? He's, he's already preset for Jesus Christ to come. We're going back now. Jesus Christ is coming to them now and says, except you repent, you know, you shall likewise pray. So now, they sh he was expecting that the effect of John the Baptist's ministry should have been taking place and should have been kicking in. John the Baptist told them this back, back here. It says in, John, in Luke the third chapter, just in case I said John, because I'm getting a little tongue twisted here. In Luke the third chapter, I'm going to read um, verse 3, and then I'm going to jump down to 7. In verse 3 it says, And he came into all the country about Jordan, preaching the baptism of repentance for the remission of sins. See, this is what he's doing. He's preaching the baptism of repentance. And see, for this repentance as it pertains to Israel, there was a prerequirement. This is what John the Baptist is preaching. He's, he's preaching the pre-requirement of the baptism of repentance. So in other words, if they're going to line up and be in a position to do what God wants them to do, they need to be water baptized first and foremost. Now, once they're water baptized, look what I'm going to jump, up, jump down to 7. Luke 3, 7. <clears throat> then said he to the multitude that came forth to be baptized of him, O generation of vipers, who hath warned you to flee from what? The wrath to come. Look what he goes on to say in verse 8. Bring forth therefore fruits worthy of what? Repent. Repentance is the topic. This is what we're talking about today. We, we went over that. It's going to connect to what we're doing later. But really I want you to begin to focus on repentance here. As it pertains to them. And then we're going to show you how it pertains to us. Because the word repentance, just like we talked about the word grace a few weeks ago, can be very confusing if you don't understand the program that you are in. If you don't understand repentance means something to them, and they had to do something to, in order to be in position to repent. And how posi uh, uh, repentance is positioned with you and I. If you don't see that there's a contrast. And if you try to make them say the same thing. Like people that don't understand how to rightly divide the word of truth. They want it to say the same thing. They want faith and works and faith alone to be the same thing. They want grace to them and grace to us to be the same thing. They want repentance to them and repentance to us to be the same thing. But you know what? They simply are not and you cannot make them be. You can't make them be the same thing because the writer of the book has made distinctions between the two that you need to recognize if you're going to be a minister of reconciliation and tell somebody else about it, which each and every one of you in this room are called to be. That's right. Yeah. So if you just sit back thinking, oh, I just hear this message, but uh, okay, I'm just uh, it's just another message. No, this is information that you need because God has called you to be a minister of reconciliation. To maybe that one person that you have an influence on. To maybe the two people that you have. Maybe the family that you have an influence on. He goes and he says, Bring forth therefore fruits worthy of repentance, and begin not to say within yourselves, We have Abraham to our father. He's talking exclusively to the children of Israel here. How can you miss the audience? Am I children of Israel? No. Abraham in this sense, the physical seed of Abraham? He has his audience. He says, we have Abraham to our father. For I say unto you, God is able to make of these stones raise up children of Abraham. He goes a little further. He says, and now also the axe is laid unto the root of the trees. Every tree which therefore, uh, every tree therefore which bringeth what? Not forth, not, not forth good fruit is what? 
What does you down mean? Cut down. See, this term's going to keep kicking up. As long, whenever you're line upon line, precept upon precept, and you're dealing with the same topics, this whole thing begins to cut, come over and over again. He's just reiterating what he's talking about over here. So this is the type of thing we begin to understand and we begin to see when we keep context. We keep the focus of what God is doing with the scriptures and we keep everything in the context that it goes down. Now, Lord, he goes on to say, it's hewn down and then what? Cast into the see, this is essential. He, now, not only is it hewn down, it's cast into the fire. If it's hewn down and cast into the fire, do they have another opportunity? No. No. This is something important because, see, a lot of individuals are confused. In this particular program, what God is doing with them, if you lack repentance, the result thereof is that you're going to be cut down, stacked, and cast into the fire. There's consequences. There's some accountability to not repenting. The absence of repentance or change for Israel caused them to fall or to be severed or to be cut off. Verse 10. And the people asked him saying, what shall we do then? Whenever you're talking about a faith that has works combined with it, the question always should be, what should we do? Because in faith as it pertains to the circumcision, there is always work. There's always something to do. So if I'm going to be justified or if I'm going to truly be in a state of repentance, there's something that I need to be doing to show my meats that's good for repentance. My fruits that's good for repentance. There's some things that I need to be doing because if I'm not doing them, it's not optional in this program. It's 100% necessity that there's some things that you need to be doing because when Jesus Christ looked back and see that you're not doing them and you're not doing the repentance as it pertains to the program, there's consequences. That's right. In time past, we're talking now. Right. And the people asked of him, saying, what shall we do? Verse 11. He answered and said unto them, he that hath two coats, let him impart to him that hath none, and he that hath meat, let him do likewise. So there's a simple example. If you got two coats, you see somebody with no coats, take one of your coats and give it to the person that don't have a coat, so they all have a coat. If you see somebody that don't have no food, you have some food, take some of your food and give them so that they'll have some food. These things seem to be so subtle and like, okay, that's easy to do. Some people do this and they're not saved. But it's important for the time that's being made reference to. Do you know that Israel is going to go through a great, great tribulation? They're going to go through a time of trouble. And each, every little aspect of what's being said here is going to be essential for them to get through it. If they're not helping each other out, if they're not going, you know, doing those things that's meet for to show that they are who they are. We go a little further. Then came also publicans to be baptized. See what happens first? Baptism happened first because baptism was the pre-requirement of repentance. And then now that they're baptized, then there's some works to be done. See, this represented faith. And then after they exhibited that faith, they had to have their works that go along with it. That's why in this program it says faith plus works. And if you didn't have faith plus works, you didn't have real faith. There's no mystery to me about it. I'm not confused about this. I'm not confused about today. I don't need any works to show for it because Jesus Christ accomplished all the work that was set forth for me. When I stand before a holy and just God, he's not going to be looking for any works for me because all the work that was required for my salvation was accomplished by Jesus Christ over 2,000 years ago. Amen. But in their program, mm -hmm. works were necessary. Mm -hmm. Works were necessary in their program. So we have to understand that and we have to highlight it so when we're expressing it to somebody, it was necessary here. If they didn't have the works, just like James says, faith without works is dead. is dead. It really, I understand what he means. 
I, I put it in the program that it applies to. But it doesn't apply to my program, but it does apply in time past. That's why I understand a four time is essential because there's certain doctrine that apply a four time that doesn't apply but now. Let's go a little further than this. Verse 12, then came also publicans to be baptized and said unto him, Master, what shall we do? And he said unto them, exact no more than that which is appointed to you. Tax collectors, publicans. Exact no more than that which is, just be honest about the money. Just get what you got coming. Don't try to rob the people and tell them they owe more and put it in your pocket. Don't do it. Simple things, but necessary in order for them. If they didn't exact the amount that was due to them, would they still be walking in faith? Absolutely not. Would they be doing the works that's meet for repentance? Would they still be a, a candidate for this salvation that God is offering them? Because their faith had to be accompanied with the works the way that God laid it out. You have to understand this. So let's go a little further. And the soldiers, verse 14, and the soldiers likewise demanded of him saying, and what shall we do? And he said unto them, do violence to no man, neither accuse any falsely, and be content with your wages. So he told them a lot. He says, neither accuse do violence to no man, neither accuse any falsely, don't tell no lie on anybody, just don't go around hurting people, and then be content with what you have. Now some people would do, they would try to take this and then start preaching it to you. Let me try to gloss this and try to see how I can make this apply to their life because this, this, is, I mean, this is in the gospel, so I got to make this apply to your life. <clears throat> let me see here, let me take a look, let me take a look here. Let me take a look how we can do this. What do you say? A soldier. You know we are soldiers. In the, in the army of the Lord, brother. In the army of the Lord. We are soldiers. So, so, so you see, you see, uh, likewise he demanded said unto him, do violence to no man. How many of you just go around slapping people? How, sometimes you just, somebody do something, you just want to haul off and slap them. You know, they, and they'll say, okay, God said do violence to no man. Y'all just, some of y'all just want to fight. Neither accuser, how many go around telling lies on people? Be content with your wages. Don't get mad because you only make $13 an hour. You should have went to college so you could have got a job for $26 an hour. That's the truth. It's, it's really sad, but that's really how they'll start trying to preach this. And now they're trying to make this doctrine to you when that's not even doctrine to you. But now I have to make these great leaps and try to make these pictures and make these big fantastic stories to keep your attention and then to try to let you leave with some type of moral compass about it, some type of moral uh, component to it when it doesn't even apply. And I, and I want it to be somewhat comical because that's what it is, comical. And it's also sad. I can laugh at it, but inside I'm almost weeping because as much as I say, I'm on, I can almost guarantee you that it's going on to at least 90% of the churches Absolutely. today. Absolutely. They're taking passages out of Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John and doing the same exact thing, trying to make the doctrine apply to them, and it doesn't. If you don't recognize this as time passed, as a comfort to show you how through patience we maintain our hope, you're not using it properly. You're using it unlawfully. You're trying to bring somebody under the condemnation of something that doesn't apply to their situation. So in essence, what God is telling them that if they didn't maintain it, they would be an issue of being cut off. They had to maintain a level of works, even after they were saved, and God was watching them. And if they didn't do these things meet for repentance, they would be cut off. I'm just going to read a little further, then we'll go on. John answered and said unto them, I indeed baptize you with water, but... Uh, one mightier than I cometh that latcheth, of whose shoes I am not worthy to unloose. He shall baptize you with the Holy Spirit and with fire, whose fan is in his hand, and he will thoroughly purge his floor, and he will garner the wheat into his harbor, but the chaff he will burn with what? There's consequences in this program. And when you try to say that there's no consequences in the Bible, you're overlooking this program. And when you begin to look at our program, once a person 
has accepted the salvation that God has provided for him, and there is no damnation or unquenchable fire consequences, it's because you fail to see that there's a distinction between what God is doing with them in time past versus what he's doing with us right now. So, in essence, what I want to summarize this area, in the just beginning, this area of what's going on is that the end thereof is that the fact that they don't continue in their type of repentance, which is for them to continually do those things that were meet for repentance, just like he said here, after their baptism of repentance, it resulted in them being cut down. Let's turn to Romans. Because this is where we're going to pick up at. We realize that at the crucifixion of Christ, Jesus Christ gave them an extension. He told them, Father, forgive them for they know not what they do. And even when the Holy Spirit comes on the scene, he begins to minister to the apostle through the uh, through the apostles and through and through Stephen. And we see that the Holy Spirit gives them an opportunity also at the stoning of Stephen. What did the God the Spirit tell Israel? When, st when Stephen is being stoned, he's a representation of God the Holy Spirit. And when he's being stoned, what did he say concerning Israel? That's what he said before, but he's being stoned now. He's almost at his death. He's that moments away from his death. And he laid not this sin to their charge. So we realize that now they're in a position where God is ready to cut them down. And that axe is to where? Where, where did um, Luke say the axe would be? To the root. They're about to come down, and you know. So the point is, is that when we get over here to Romans the eleventh chapter, we recognize that there's been a transition that is beginning to take place. You know, Brother Steve and Commissioner, could you just bring that chart behind you up, just very briefly, so you get a shot of it? You know, for him, okay. Um, we want to show this distinction here of why it's so important to rightly divide the word of truth so that we can actually see what is taking place. So we're just not saying some things that have no substance. We utilize that information in time past that was talking about was given to us a four times to get to where we are in Romans. Now we properly have placed ourselves in the doctrinal information that we're about to talk about. Very briefly, uh, Romans the 11th chapter and 11th verse says, I say then, have they stumbled that they should fall? Says God forbid. But look what it goes right back to say. We're in Romans 11, 11. He says, but rather through their fall, salvation is come unto the Gentiles for to provoke them to jealousy. Now, I want to show, this was God's revealed plan. This is what he revealed. Once Israel rejected what God revealed and Israel, and, and Israel falls, just like we're talking about now, God revealed a hidden wisdom or what he called a mystery, something that he had kept secret. That's why it's important to rightly divide the word of truth and understand that there is a division. God revealed something. See, this all went together right now. In fact, we're talking about the fall that Israel is taking, is taking place at Israel right here, is right in this area. If I'm not mistaken, is that where the fall would be? Yeah, it's actually right here. Mm -hmm. It begins to take place. This is the area that scripture that we're talking about now in Romans 11. When Israel rejects what God was doing by not repenting, that's what we're talking about, they didn't repent, God unfolded something that he kept hidden before the foundation of the world. He didn't reveal it to anybody other than the Apostle Paul. This is why we say when we study the right word of God, you have to rightly divide the word of truth. And the doctrine for our information today is found between the books of Romans to Philemon. We're not making up something that just is like some type of code or something. 
Right. We're not. We're simply doing what God has told us to do as it pertains to the gospel. Let's go a little further because we, there's still another issue. All of that's just side note information that I just can't pass up without giving you that information. But there's a message to us exclusively here. I say then, have they stumbled that they should fall? God forbid, but rather through their fall, salvation is coming to the Gentiles for to provoke them to jealousy. The salvation in Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John was exclusively to Israel. The Jesus Christ said, I came into my own. My own received them not. Only go to the children of the house of Israel. But because they failed, now we see a salvation that has come over to us Gentiles. Look at verse 12. Now if the fall of them, talking about Israel, be the riches of the world, talking about us, and the diminishing of them, talking about Israel, be the riches of the Gentiles, how much more their fullness? Verse 13, for I speak to you Gentiles, inasmuch as I am an apostle of the Gentiles, I magnify my office. This is the apostle Paul. When we're talking about Paul, we're not magnifying Paul. I'm not Paul, 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 Paul. But God has given Paul an office that I can't get past because he gave him an office that he's the apostle to the Gentiles. I know some of you think that Jesus Christ in his earthly ministry is the apostle to the church, the body of Christ. However, Jesus Christ from heaven's glory gave Paul the office of the apostle of the Gentiles. So when we speak Paul, 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 it's only because we're following Paul as Paul followed. That's all we're doing. But there's more to it. There's more to it. For I speak to you Gentiles as much as I'm apostle of the Gentiles. I magnify my, my, magnify my office. If by any means I may provoke to emulation them which are of my flesh and might save some, he still has a heart toward Israel. For if the casting away of them be the reconciling of the world, what shall the receiving of them be but life from the dead? For the first roots be holy. I'm moving kind of fast now. If there's any questions at the end, you can get it, but we're trying to get to uh, the, the, the essence of what we're talking about here. For if the, fruit, the first roots be holy, the lump is also holy. And if the root be holy, so are the branches. So in other words, the source is holy. Everything that's on that tree will be holy. And that's just pretty much what it is. We can go into Romans 6 and kind of develop that. And if some of the branches be broken off. Now this is important here. If some of the branches of this tree be broken off, and if they were cut off, who, is that branch, who would that branch be that he's making a reference to? Israel. Israel. So some of those branches that were on this olive tree were cut off. And thou being a wild olive tree, who is thou? That's the wild olive tree. Gentile. The Gentile. So now we see you and I as members of the body of Christ being referred to as a wild olive tree. And look what God did. We're grafted among them. With them partakers of the root and the fatness of the olive tree. So now God has adopted us or taken us and placed us into Christ. And now we have taken um, partakers of the root. And now God has given us an identity. Look what it goes on to say here. Boast not against the branches, but if thou boast, thou bearest not the root, but the root thee. You'll find that this idea of boasting that is being made reference to here is the fact that you and I have done absolutely nothing to get in the position that we have that are in. Now, some we we had to believe, we had to, but that's belief is the only thing in the scriptures that is not referred to as a work. The trust that we placed in Christ when we couldn't do it, when we were without strength, God, Christ died for the ungodly. When we, were, we couldn't do anything but trust, we were in a position just dead in our sins, couldn't trust bad, we couldn't do nothing. All I could do is trust that you can do something for me. I was watching a uh, television uh, news broadcast the other day, and I believe it was a little cat or something that was stuffed in a, um, in a drain pipe or something. That cat couldn't do anything to get itself out of it. It was also a horse that was in this hole the other day. And he was just in the hole and he was fighting, but he couldn't do anything to get himself out that hole. All he could do is trust that somebody from somewhere could get him out that hole. That's what we've done today. We simply trusted what God has accomplished for us through the finished work of Jesus Christ. So it goes boast not again. So it leaves no room for boasting. And I find so often in, the, in, 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 in Christendom today, people find they so suddenly boast about what's going on. Like they really, well, I pray every day, I speak in tongues, I, 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 I walk in the spirit, I, I believe God, I believe God. I reminded God of his promise to me and God had to grant it because I reminded him of his promise. <laughs> like what is, it? are you serious? And this is the kind of stuff that's going on because they believe within themselves that it's something that about them that God respects. 
God is no respecter of person. Amen. You know the only reason God is doing anything for you and I? Because he sees us in his sight. Right. Yeah. Oh, don't, think, don't ever think you get somewhere in and of yourself that God respects you because you're doing something right. That's the truth. That's the truth. Have you gotten to that point yet? You come here enough on Sundays. You tell enough people. You read, you study, you don't watch TV, you don't go to concerts, you don't go to the movies. You're doing some stuff that God should be happy about. And all of that is, you know, questionable. You give enough, which I don't think any of us give enough. Have we got to that point where we think we're doing it? Minister Rondell was just making the reference. We can't get complaints. Don't get weary in well-doing, because in due season we shall reap if we faint not. Don't get weary in this. Don't stay compelled. Stay zealous. 2 Corinthians 7. Second Corinthians 7. <clears throat> Second Corinthians 7, 8. Through 11, I'll read. For though I made you sorry with a letter, I do not repent. Though I did repent, for I perceive that the same epistle hath made you sorry, though it were but for a season. Now I rejoice that you were made sorry, but that ye sorry to repentance, for you were made sorry after a godly manner, that you might receive damage by us in nothing. For godly sorrow worketh repentance to salvation, not to be repented of, but the sorrow of the world worketh death. Look what verse 11 says. For behold, the selfsame thing that you sorrow after a godly sort, what carefulness it wrought in you, what clearing of yourselves, yea, what indignation, yea, what fear, yea, what vehement desire, yea, what zeal, yea, what revenge. In all things you have approved yourselves to be clear in this matter. The Apostle Paul wrote a book of wrote a letter of correction to the Corinthian church, and we don't have to go into what they were doing. But the church was already saved. Okay? They were already saved. But repentance in the mind of a believer, or you and I, is simply being not conformed to this world, but being transformed by the renewing of our mind. It's changing our mind as it pertains to how we perceive the world and everything that's in it. It takes the scriptures to change your mind about it. Now, we're going to go into some more verses about this, but I'm going to show some things about what he says here that it just really hits on the point here. See, godly sorrow worketh repentance. It's something in the process of God getting the information in you that is not, people say conviction, but it's not so much conviction as it is correction. You're only doing, in most cases, you're doing wrong because you don't know any better. Once you know better, now you have an opportunity to do better. So the change, the repentance here is to like, I used to steal or I used to may not steal. And I use this quite a bit, but I didn't steal because my grandmother taught me not to steal. So I'm a good person because I don't steal. My grandmother, that's how our family's raised. We don't steal. But my not stealing is not a faith. It's a good thing externally, people, I'm not going to take your stuff. You ain't got to worry about me taking your stuff. You leave the room. It's a good thing as that pertains. But it's not a faith. Why? Where God says, but he himself shall no more but work. Amen. So now my mindset, see, that's self-righteousness. You thought it was, see, everything external, just because it looked good, it's only good when your mind is changed. Come on. The, my, my mind had to change as it pertained to stealing based upon what doctrine said. Doctrine said, let him that steal, stole, steal no more, but let him work with his hands so that he'll be able to give others. So now when I don't steal, my grandmother don't get the credit no more. Glory to God. Glory to God. Amen. Repent. I'm changing that godly sorrow. Now I'm 
I'm like I was good within myself, but I, I'm not good. The only reason I'm not stealing is because the word of God instructs me that's not what I should do. But I should work with my hands so I can give you something if you need it. Amen. Now who gets the glory? God, now you, repentance is working in me. Look, this is beautiful. This is beautiful here. But I'm going to show you just a few things here. Just show a few things. Look at what he says here. Look at what he says here. Verse 11, for behold, the selfsame thing that you have sorrowed for after godly sort will forever, on um, what carefulness it wrought in you, the plague of yourselves, what indignation, he says, what fear? Does that, what fear, what, what fear do you think he's talking about here? Philippians 2 and 12, what does it say? Work out your own salvation with fear and trembling. Amen, so the, now the fear is working out my salvation. This fear that he's making a reference to is working out a salvation that I already have. Thank you. I'm not working to get saved. It's the working out of that salvation. That's right. It's the reverence and the understanding that I'm applying to the situation based on the doctrine that's now in my mind. That's right. He goes on. He says this. He says this. Look what he says. Carefulness it wrought in you. What clearing of yourselves. What indignation. What fear. What vehement desire. What zeal? I'm only highlighting a few. What zeal do you think he's talking about? Titus 2.14. Titus 2.14. It's the grace of God that what? Right in the air. Let's look at that. Real briefly. I hear you mumbling now. Keep us up to say no to ungodly. Amen. Look what it says here. Look what it says here. Titus 2.14. Who gave himself for us that he might redeem us from all iniquity and purify unto himself a peculiar That's people. Right. What? Zealous of good works. Zealous. We need to be zealous Come of on. good works. Amen. Come on. That repentance worketh the zeal in us. Mm -hmm. That change of mind worketh the zeal. I'm ready now. Mm -hmm. I'm ready because now you've given me some information that I can attack. Anything that comes at me with the information, I'm ready for this stuff now. That's right. Have you ever taken a test that you were fully prepared to take? Oh, sure. There wasn't no anxiety or anxiousness about you taking the test because, man, I'm going to ace this test. And I hope they give me an extra credit question because I'm going to get 105 on this test. I got this. I understand. I know this. I've studied this. I have this. The next time somebody asks me this question, I'm going to have this information. That's right. The way we embrace the doctrine is not a head knowledge, it's a spiritual knowledge. It becomes a part of who you are. That's it. So now look what you're ready to do. Look what you're ready to do. What zeal, he says, what revenge. Come on. What revenge? What revenge is he making a reference to? It's right here in this book, 2 Corinthians 10. 2 Corinthians 10. Verse 6. 2 Corinthians 10, verse 6. 2 Corinthians 10, verse 6. And having in a readiness to revenge all what? Disobedience. Disobedience when your what? Obedience. Obedience is revealed, is, is, is uh, fulfilled. You have to understand, you can revenge the things you've done wrong. Once you get the information, now you can do them right. We're ready now. This is, we're in power. So now he said, all oh, this comes from our godly sorrow that worketh repentance in us. Our, God, our godly sorrow is not a bad thing. Not at all. Our godly sorrow is what causes us to persevere and keep pressing on. But there is some issues. There are some issues here. First Timothy. You're familiar with this one. I'm gonna go to Second Timothy, but I want to read First Timothy first. Second Timothy. I'm sorry. Second Timothy. Two. I'm sorry I'm a little long-winded today, but, man, I am preaching two months. Two months. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Amen. I mean, not preach, but had an opportunity to share. When you don't have an opportunity to share, you get a little antsy. Yes, sir. And your messages you be writing, you think they this big. They this little, but they be this big. So 
I have to I have to close this out. Okay, so bear with me. Second Corinthians, I mean Second Timothy, the second chapter. It says in verse twenty-five. And meekness, instructing those that will oppose themselves. Now look what it says. In meekness, instructing those that oppose themselves, if God per adventure or perhaps will give them repentance, how? According to the, to the acknowledging of the truth. Are we talking about saved individuals or unsaved individuals? Hallelujah. You have to know. He's talking about a saved individual here that he's talking about the individuals have to have the ability to instruct the individuals that are in the church that are opposing themselves. That's one of the keys how you know that they're saved. Because an unsaved person, is he opposing himself? No. He's doing what his father told him to do. His That's father right. the devil, the Bible says. That's right. So now once you are a new creation in Christ and you're doing things contrary to godliness, you're opposing yourself. Right. It's not who God positionally has set you up to be. That's what's going on. That's right. That what's going on when you're doing things contrary to who you are, you're opposing yourself. So now as a teacher, I have to try to instruct you, look, you need to do things that like you are. Not because you're going to get cut off. But there's a purpose and a meaning to do, to live the life that God has granted. And meekness instructing those who oppose themselves, if per adventure, God will do what? Give them repentance. Repentance is not the same repentance. That's right. Repentance is being not conformed to this world, but being transformed by the, it's a process. It's a process of changing your mind from bad doctrine bad character defects that have been developed within you unto newness of life. But be not conform to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. That's right. Now, this present world has an attraction to you. And you have an attraction to it. That's the truth. Because you still have a magnetic force that draws you to it that you still abide in. What is that? The flesh. The flesh. Now, the good news is that God doesn't count the flesh against you. But it still has a pull to do things contrary to him. So Paul says what he had to do was to hold under his body. Corinthians, I mean, Romans 12 says, uh, present your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable unto God, which is your what? Reasonable, sir. So what we're doing to uh, hold your body as a living sacrifice is saying that your body ain't got nothing to do with it. Sacrifice your body and allow Christ to live in it. So this is the things that we say. Now, verse 26 in 2 uh, in, 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 in Timothy 2. And that they may recover themselves out of the snare of the devil who are what? Taken captive by him at his will. Taken captive of him by his will. Satan cannot do anything to cause you to lose your salvation. That's right. Hallelujah. Yeah. Thank you, Lord. His job now is to render you ineffective in ministry. Right. And you know what is so essential about him rendering you ineffective in ministry? If he can do that to a large enough group of us, and I'm cutting this short to a certain extent, but if you have questions, we'll give you just a moment of questions. Turn to Romans. Yes, we're going to close out there. Romans 11. Look what he says here. <clears throat> Verse 20. Romans 11, verse 20. Our verse started 19. Thou wilt say then, the branches were broken off, that I might be grafted in. Talking about Israel, now we're grafted in. Well, because of unbelief, they were broken off. And thou standest by faith, be not high-minded, but what? Again, fear. fear. So we never get to a place where we've arrived. We recognize I'm where I am by the grace of God and everything that God sees in me. He only sees it because he sees me in his son. That's right. And the more I have an opportunity to allow Christ to live through me, the life that I now live, I live by the faith of the son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. I have an opportunity for God to be glorified in this earth. But it's never me. It's always him. That's right. So now, behold, therefore, the goodness of God. Now look what he said. Now, well, verse 21. I'm sorry about that. For if God spared not the natural branches, look what he's saying here. This is where we're concluding to. This is the conclusion here. If God spared not the natural branches, take heed lest he also spare not what? So what is God going to do? Is he going to cut us off and throw us into the fire? No. Listen to what he says here. That's not our issue. 
What he's saying here, behold, therefore, the goodness and the severity of God. Goodness is in contrast to severity. Severity means to what? Stern. Stern, but severity has a connotation that is really telling you what God done did. Severity. What's the root word? Severe. Suffer. So you see that. So this is real. It has high, high standing consequences. Look what it says here. Severity of God and of them which fail severity but toward thee goodness if thou continue in his goodness. Otherwise, now this is the root word of this. Thou also shall be cut off. Cut off. Severity and severe in that case is talking about how these individuals were cut off. And if you don't, if you're not careful, you're going to be cut off collectively. This is a corporate message okay. based upon what we should be doing. Okay. Because if we as a group collectively stop doing what we should be doing, the age as we know it okay. is going to be cut short. Absolutely. You have individuals going to churches all over the city. How many grace churches do you have here? One. Can you count them on one hand? Yeah. How many people are in this one church? That's a lot today. I thank God for you. I praise God for seeing you. Absolutely. But the idea here is that we are few in number, and now out of the individuals that come, how many of you are actively going out and being ministers of reconciliation? Every one of us. How many of you are actually allowing the doctrine to work within you so that you can be zealous, so that you can maintain your patience and maintain the, inf the information to give to others as it pertains to what God is doing today. Or how many of us come to church, but when we leave, we just fall back into the world. Let me tell you about that. You remember Demas? What did, what did the word say about Demas in 2 Timothy 4 and 10? He forsake me. He forsake me. Loving what? The world. This present world. We have an attraction to this world, and if you begin to wean yourself away from the doctrine, then you'll, grow, you'll draw right back to where you came from. That's a promise. And guess what? You're going to still be saved. That's a promise. God saved you, but you're not going to be effective to what God is doing, and God is going to look down here at a time where there's going to be some individuals that save that are not going forth with the gospel, of the, the doctrine of the gospel of truth, with sound doctrine. <laughs> And this is what we are coming up against. This is why we want to stay so still. That's why I'm blessed to hear what Mr. Rondell said earlier. He's about to open his house up? How many of you ever consider opening your house up? I don't want no people all up in my house <laughs> and feed them too. People already don't know how to leave. I don't want nobody all up in my house. And he's going to open his house up and feed them and give them the word of God. To God be the glory. To God... Um, Brother Jim, Sister Barbara, and all of you that are doing things out there that God is getting the glory out of, you're not ashamed of the gospel. You're trying to share the gospel. That's where we need to be at. Amen. We hardly ever see each other outside the church. It's not a social network. We are a group of believers called the church. We come together to get the information so we can go out there and be an influence on the world. And that's where we need to be. If anybody doesn't know the gospel of salvation, it simply is the fact that Christ died for our sins according to the scriptures, that he was buried, that he rose on the third day according to the scriptures, and by simply placing your faith and trust in what God has done through his son Jesus Christ, you will receive eternal salvation. You don't have to write a letter. You don't have to walk to the front of the church. You don't have to do anything but in the prophecy of your heart, trust that gospel. God will save you right where you are. Thank God for this message. Thank God for an opportunity. Yeah. Is there any questions or comments? Do I?